Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Constructive Liberty Podcast, Intentionally Designing a Lifestyle of Freedom. Today I'm joined by Paul Barron, and we're just going to jump right into the episode. So with that, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ken. Nice to be here to meet you and your audience. Yeah, awesome. So give us a little bit of your background. Tell us who Paul Barron is and kind of a, a an overview of your career going from coming out of high school and yeah. how you got into all the startups that you've done through your life up to where you're at today. Well, Ken, um, I'm 71 years old, so I don't think I should go back to the beginning um, and take, <laughs> take you through the entire journey. Um, but uh, How about the highlights? Spices, the, the highlights. <clears throat> well, they, fortunately, there have been excuse me. Fortunately, there have been more highlights than low lights in a pretty long career of entrepreneurship, um, starting up businesses, helping others start up businesses. Um, I have worked for some major corporations as well as small businesses. Um, so along the journey and the path from uh, from high school through college, where I majored in mathematics and became a high school mathematics teacher out of college. Um, but I uh, made some money to supplement my parents' good graces during college by straining tennis rackets for the athletic department. And that became a, a vocation that I was very good at and I enjoyed a lot. Uh, today, 50 years later, I'm still a competitive tennis player. Um, wow. I enjoy stringing my own tennis rackets, but I made a career out of it during college. And then I opened up a tennis sporting goods store uh, when I graduated college, as well as starting my my focus career, which was to become a high school mathematics teacher. I'd probably still be teaching to this day, or at least have made that a full career um, through the years. Um, if I was just able to teach, I love the students, but I didn't like a lot of the administrative things. Um, and uh, activities. I didn't like dealing with a lot of the uh, school's regulations and other things that kind of restricted uh, just the interaction with the students that I really enjoyed. I, I um, hear so that from a lot of teachers, how how the administrative side of it is really what drives them out of teaching. It's, it, you know, they uh, love the kids and, and there's can, a... Absolutely, Ken, and I can appreciate that from a personal perspective, but it also kind of framed uh, what came afterwards, um, mm. not only the fact that I devoted more time to my retail business that I started with a partner that was be- becoming, uh, that was growing and becoming more successful. And we actually grew it from one tennis retail shop to three tennis shops um, in the Hudson Valley, New York region, which is where I was. Uh, I went to school in New Paltz, New York, part of the State University of New York system and uh, and stayed up there. And, and those shops became uh, a success. Um, I sold out to my partner because then I was uh, the proverbial godfather made the offer that I couldn't refuse um, by somebody who asked me to come work for them. And that, that began my kind of seesaw journey of working for companies, learning what I didn't know. Um, I, I was always, I don't know if the, if the right expression is smart enough or wise enough or just open to the opportunities enough to understand that there was a lot that I didn't know. And still to this day, 70 years later, um, there's a lot that I don't know. And I always enjoy, you know, figuring out what's Paul going to do when he grows up. And so when I uh, get up in the morning, it's always good to be in a situation where either I could learn from somebody or something. And so that that prompted um, me not only taking positions, working for companies to see what those resources might bring to the table that could help me identify what I like to do, what hats I like to wear, what I was good at, what I wasn't. And when you're talking about a startup, and, uh, you know, an idea is great. Um, everybody's got them. Um, at least you hope that you, that you come up with something creative at some point in your life. And you think that maybe there's something that either you want to do, could do, um, maybe you could do better than somebody else or, or just come up with something totally innovative, uh, but something that drives your passion. Um, and when that happens to you and, and it doesn't always, and it doesn't have to, um, I mean, people, uh, you know, can thrive and make good lives for themselves and for their families um, by finding a position uh, that works within a structure of another company, another business or situation, whether it be, you know, civil service, political, um, you know, armed services or, or corporate world um, and and find a role that's very satisfying, uh, both financially as well as emotionally. Um, me, um, I kind of like the control aspects of the biz- of of owning a business and taking the responsibility and taking the risks. Um, these are all aspects of starting a business that if you don't have the, um, 
the ability or the desire um, to take a risk, um, to not necessarily know that that the uh, vision you have is going to succeed, then entrepreneurship or buying, building, startup is probably not for you. Um, and you also have to have a solution to a problem. Some people go creating mm-hmm. problems um, just to just to find a way to um, to work or to um, to provide a service or business or product. Um, that's not the uh, ingredient to success, at least not that I found. There has to be a real problem out there that you have a solution to, um, whether it's a solution that you've created, invented, developed, or found. Um, and, and that latter is pretty much how I found a career for myself and for mm. my family and friends. Um, and when I say um, the latter, I mean um, I've all... I, I developed early on the ability to identify an audience of high value customers for products and services. I worked for a Russian company for 12 years that had really cool um, video, audio, um, navigation system uh, technologies, um, not unlike what you and I are experiencing today on the Zoom call. Uh, and your audience will experience it hearing this with MP3 or audio technologies. These technologies that sit under the covers, so to speak, um, on applications or devices on your on your mobile phones or on your computers, um, the software that sits on the chips inside these devices. Um, this Russian company had a suite of applications that was was uh, very beneficial to the uh, advancement of these types of solutions for people to right. be able to communicate better. And so it was a relationship that went uh, about twelve years, really positive. Um, you know, um, political issues aside in today's world, um, Russian people, wonderful people, um, that, uh, were, uh, I developed a real strong relationships, still trade birthday and Christmas cards with them, even though the relationship ended in about 2000 after about, like I said, 12 years. And, uh, and that's pretty much because I saturated the U.S. market for them and their technologies to the extent that, um, I was looking then for something else to do. And I developed this, this, capability that was being recognized as somebody who could take uh, a product from a foreign country and articulate it to the American audience. And so after that, it was a kind of a whirlwind of me capitalizing on certain opportunities that either found me or I found. There was a uh, an Austrian baby bottle manufacturer that had a very innovative design for baby bottle that I, I helped market into the United States and help them find their customers and, and audience. There was a self-service dog wash from Australia um, a Chinese headband headphone for children um, that had characters like the Disney and Nickelodeon characters on it. Um, that was just a headband for that connected to their phones and uh, music boxes. Um, and uh, and then there was a media board from Israel. And then I retired a couple of times throughout the whole journey. <laughs> uh, and because I was always working as a hired gun for these people. Um, and again, well, Keeping this focused on, you know, the whole startup mentality, um, you know, trying to identify which which hats I wore well. Um, you know, it's one thing to have an idea or to have a skill like I found I had in terms of being able to identify these high value customers for these businesses or vendors, strategic partnerships, anything that would help the companies grow, whether it be through partnerships, revenue, whatever, um, that I was very good at. But I also learned along the way the hats I liked and the ones I don't like to win. And that's really important for somebody who's starting up a business. Um, yeah, for sure. Asked, I, go ahead. When, when you started talking about, about what hats you like to wear, I was curious how you went about finding, you know, what hats you like to wear. Was that something that you kind of just grew into naturally or, or did you actually have to put some concerted effort into, into figuring out what it was that you wanted to do and developing that? Well, as we started this conversation, Ken, it kind of happened early on with that teaching experience where I learned that whole administrative aspect of the job didn't really appeal to me. As my career developed and I was involved in positions where I was either a sales manager, um, business development, um, a factory manager, um, I learned that there were, um, I didn't like the financial aspects of, of, of managing businesses. I didn't like the hiring and firing. Um, I was more independent than a manager of people. Um, you know, I like to think that I have good relationships and good friendships. That doesn't always extend to being able to identify, nurture, um, talent. Um, I, I don't think, uh, 
some evidence to the contrary, because I have a wonderful team today at my current business, the wall printer. They communicate with each other very well. We have very little turnover. Um, I built a team of about 10 to 15 people, um, 10 people full-time, five remote part-time salespeople. Um, but uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a talent um, that you want to recognize in yourself and in others. And when people ask me what's the what are the ingredients to being a really good CEO or leader or even owner of a of a company, whether it be a startup or, or a large larger business, um, established business, um, my answer is always the same. You have to be smart enough to hire the best people to do the jobs that are required, but then wise enough to back off and let them do it. Um, yeah. So whereas I found out that the hats I like to wear were those relationships, building customers, identifying customers, um, and then. In turn, that allowed for the um, financial resources to be developed that would support a growing business. Um, you know, sales is uh, not a dirty word. Um, it is uh, it's something that every every business needs, um, and you know, to survive and uh, and and customers as well. And so, and you want to, and you want to be able to support those customers. So the people who have to post sale you know, interact with those customers and provide outstanding service and support to make sure that if it's a product or service that it's working to their expectations. You know, that's another whole skill, one that I don't, uh, a hat that I don't wear well, but I've hired good people to do that um, yeah. and, and and allowed them to do that. And uh, that helps the business grow as well. And so, again, I, there's an expression I always use for people in my business today and prior uh, ventures, um, stay in your lane. You know, if you hire somebody to be the social media marketing manager, we'll do that. But when people outside of your lane do require some type of support and service, you know, be open, be, uh, you know, make, make your skills available, but don't think you have to do their job or you have to right. be that person. Um, you know, somebody who's doing technical support, somebody who's managing the, um, the invoicing or the sales orders or the purchase orders for the business. You know, sure, they have to know something about inventory and they have to know something about the products, but they don't have to know how to fix something, let's say. Um, right. But everybody stays in their lane, but still works in an, in an environment of mutual beneficial cooperation. Uh, yeah. That's really important to me and I think important to anybody interested in, uh, in having a startup or beginning a business operation is you're not going right. to be able to wear all the hats. I was in the <laughs> restaurant business for 12 years. Um, I got into it really for the real estate and because I had a partner that was a really good food and beverage guy. And he had an idea for a restaurant that I really liked. But I'm not like a lot of doctors and lawyers who go out to eat and think that they can be in the restaurant business. And they start investing in things that are outside of their lane. Um, right. And I, I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And so but when I got into the restaurant business, I washed dishes. I tended bar. I cooked. I learned about all these things because I wanted some exposure to those things. And I wanted to make sure that nobody was, I guess, the expression, pulling the wool over your eyes, so to speak, um, right. in different situations. But that wasn't what I was going to do, nor would I benefit the business on a day-to-day -day basis doing those things. But you want to gain knowledge. So it's it's okay to learn things, but it's not okay for you to do something at the expense of what your talents really allow you to do or need you to do. Um, yeah. And so that, again, it all goes back to finding what, what drives you. Um, you know, I could cook a hamburger with the best of people, but I still go out to buy hamburgers in restaurants. Um, that doesn't mean I have to always buy the chopped meat and, and bun and tomato and lettuce and onion <laughs> do it myself all the time. Um, you know, it's one thing to be able to do something. It's another thing to how effective is your doing it going to benefit yeah. the, the tasks required to be a successful business. Right. So how does somebody, when, once they figure out what hats they like to wear, um, whether it be managerial or the the financial side of things or actually out in, the, out in the field doing the work or maybe the sales, once they've figured out the hats they like to wear, or I don't know if this comes first or not, you mentioned the things that drive your passion. How do those two tie in together? Does one come first, you know, figure out what you're passionate about? Or do you figure out what hats you like to wear and then go develop a passion for a certain industry or something like that? How do those two play together? Yeah, and they do play together. I'm not sure that they're really mutually exclusive. You know, early on in my career, after I sold my tennis sporting goods stores and then sold my restaurant business, um, which were both based in New York, um, my parents had, had retired and moved to Florida from New York. 
<clears throat> and so I wanted to play tennis and fortunately I had a couple of successful businesses um, that allowed me to sell to my partner and and relocate. So I relocated to a climate where I could play tennis 365 days a year. Um, but I still needed to I still needed to work. I still needed a job um, and and find what it, what it was that I wanted to do. And so um, and the reason I bring that up based on the question you just raised was I wanted to be in a place that made me feel good about myself and about um, something I enjoyed doing, which was playing tennis. But I still had to work. I still had to find yeah. something that I wanted to do. So for me, being in the environment was important to me. Um, being in a, in a warm weather climate was important to me because I figured I had enough confidence in my own capabilities that once I was in a location that pleased me, I'd find a job that would please me um, or that I would be good at or that I could I could help a company or figure out what my next step was going to be. Gotcha. And so I, I think it's very important for people to feel good about themselves, their environment. But then again, we also have responsibilities. I was fortunate that I was single at the time. I didn't have a family. I didn't have children. Uh, there weren't a lot of responsibilities, you know, that I needed to, that people do have to factor into their decision making process. Um, and that stops a lot of people in their tracks. Um, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Sometimes, you know, uh, what's the expression? Necessity is the mother of invention. Um, well, if that invention is figuring out what's what your path should be, whether it be opening a business, starting a business or working for somebody, um, that that is often driven by the necessities of your life. And if that happens to be family, children, school, college obligations of, of one nature or another, taking care of your parents, taking care of your kids, one whatever it might be, could also drive that decision making process. Um, but but ultimately. When you're in an employment or a job or building a company, um, you, you have to you have to be proud of what you're doing. You know, I always needed to sleep very well at night. I'm sure there are people that don't care about whether their product is good, bad, or liable or something mm. like that, or their service. Once they make the sale, that's the end of it. They wash their hands and they move on to the next sale. Um, me, I always look at a sale as an opportunity to get a referral to more business. And I want to make sure that that customer is really happy and that customer yeah. supported well and their expectations are realized or hopefully exceeded by the product and service that they engaged me for. Right. Um, so, so again, finding, finding what you would like doing. Um, and again, what, whatever bucket that falls into, whether legal, financial, um, software development, you know, sales, marketing. Um, you know, just, you know, be in a situation where, where not only you can find a level of satisfaction and success, but also a path to learn how that then figures into the overall larger picture of benefiting the business that you're in, your coworkers, your customers. Gotcha. That, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I really like what you said about the, uh, you know, some people when they, when they make a sale, you know, it's the final thing, but if you look at the sale as the beginning of the relationship, whether than the end of the, rather than the end of the relationship, it really changes how you approach that whole thing. So that, that really stood out to me. Now you've been involved in over 20 startups. Is that right? I, I, I haven't really counted recently. I think that's <laughs> Quite a, a few though. I, th I think that's so, a fair estimate. Yeah. So what, what are some of the key elements of starting a new business? Well, first of all, um, willing, uh, as I said early on, recognizing that the business you want to start or the job you want to take is a solution to a problem. Again, you can go working for somebody because you need a paycheck. Uh, you know, you need to feed yourself and you need to feed your family. So you need some type of revenue coming in. You know, that's a reason for taking a job. Um, if you extend that to starting a business, um, there are financial obligations that you're going to face in starting a business that you are going to have to rely on either your own resources, if you have the financial resources to do that and not get a paycheck. Um, that's that's a very big consideration uh, because most startups aren't going to be revenue producing for some amount of time. Uh, whether it's a product you're developing, it's going to be a very long time before revenue uh, is coming in. If it's a service you provide, well, you have to identify, find, and capture your first cost, your first customers. Um, and, and so, and that might be a shorter sales cycle or revenue generating cycle. But at the same time, you still have to, you still have to be, um, be honest with yourself 
as to what your bandwidth is in terms of how much risk can you take, both financially and time-wise, um, in order to see that business start up and grow uh, until the point at which it may become independent because of the projections you've laid out, the business and marketing plan you've created, and again, the solution you're solving with, uh, with your products, uh, the problem you're solving, the solution you're offering. Um, whether it be a service or a product or whatever, um, that will then generate those expectations for you, for your partners, for your investors, for your employees, and for your customers. Um, yeah. So all of those factors have to come in when you're starting up a business. Um, you know, not, the first, of course, is how much risk are you willing to take? How much time are you willing to devote? To? How much money? You know, I, I call it the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. Uh, how much time do you have? Do you have the talent or do you have access to those people who believe in you and believe in the vision you have? Um, and then do you have the money to do? Um, mm. So all of those things are combined to determine whether or not you should even be considering a business as a startup for yourself. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I know, you know, in, in most startups, most most new businesses, there's a lot of challenges that they face that you if you haven't been there and done that before, you really don't realize what they are until until you actually come across them. But no, and that's not a bad thing. You know, can I? You know, I I I don't want to. I don't want to sugarcoat um, right. the um, the um, the opportunities and the benefits of starting your own business. Um, but I also don't want people to ignore the fact that you're going to be faced with obstacles, obligations, and and other pressures. Um, that you would not face if you just took a job with somebody. Yeah. And, what What are some of the challenges or obstacles that that a new startup might face? Well, uh, it, it, uh, that would the answer to that would kind of be also factored into what what is that business? Is it a product you're developing? Is it a service you're offering? Does it require you to um, to build a team, or is it something you can do on your own or with a partner, um, one or two people? You know, so that's the first thing to decide. Um, and to determine, you know, how do I get from point A to point B? Um, you go to A to B before you get to that, you know, that Z. Um, you're going to figure out, you know, um, what can I do? What do I bring to the table? What talent do I, um, when whether that is the, the time to devote to something, whether it be researching the market, um, determining whether or not there is a market for this solution to a problem that you've identified, somebody's got to figure out, well, is there a real market for this? Um, that could be you or it could be somebody you hire or somebody that is working with you. And that could be either fee-based or free, uh, again, because they want to put in their time, talent, and treasure, um, and, you know, to the, to the mission or the vision that you have for this business. So, you know, your first hurdles are just getting it off the ground, meaning you know, determining what is the market? then how are we going to develop this product? You know, how are we going to package it or how are we going to communicate it? Um, in my current business, the wall printer, by no means is what I'm about to say any kind of an, an advertisement or uh, a pitch for my current business. But just in terms of the process, you know, I identified a product that I thought was a really cool product, a vertical yeah. printing machine. I had never seen anything like it before. I was actually approached by who is now a competitor of mine um, that, um, I was approached by them to help them. It was a German company that I helped uh, that wanted me to market their product here in the United States. I could not make the deal with them because they wanted me to be, as I was many times before in the uh, description I gave you earlier, um, as a hired gun. They wanted me to be a commission salesperson for them. Right. And and I don't do that anymore. I want to I want to own and be responsible because now I'm at the point in my life where I'm willing to take the risk and if I believe in the product. And so I couldn't make the deal I wanted with them, but I started doing my homework because I thought the product was really cool and I had never seen anything like it. So I did my homework. I did my research. And that was the first step in devoting my time to that. And then I found a company and a product that was actually far superior to the one that approached me initially. Um, and this is no respect to anybody in your audience with, or yourself with German heritage. I drive a BMW. I value a well-engineered product. But the first company that approached me had a product that cost twice as much as what I thought it should be after I did my research. And I found that I was able to manufacture, produce, and develop a product that was, um, and, and a company that was in business 10 years longer than they were that invented the technology. Um, and so I, I decided to buy into their product. And, uh, and now I own 
the, the rights of the entire Western Hemisphere for this type of a vertical printing machine is the generic term. Our brand name is the wall printer. And, yeah. and we put we put people in business. We help startups um, who want to put art on walls. And that's what our machines do. Um, but again, going through that whole process of discovering what was the quality of the product I want? What was the reliability? What was the relationship with the manufacturing company that would allow me to grow my business, not only for myself, for my family, for my employees, for my investors, but also for my customers, most importantly. Because if they were satisfied, then I would get the referrals and I would be able to generate more revenue, not only from them, but from the extension of the growth of the business. And right. so um, so we're three years into it. We have 120 customers today. Uh, we're growing rapidly with about one to new customers every week. And uh, I'm very proud of the team that I built up. We work very well together. But they all wear hats that I have no interest in <laughs> myself. Um, when I started out, I got my hands dirty with ink and everything else to learn how to use the machines. But now I've got a team that supports our customers and knows those machines inside and out and can build them and repair them and service them and support our customers. And then I've got a marketing team who went out from the very early stages, um, went out to find out, well, who wants this? You know, here I was with a product that I thought was really cool, but I also had to figure out, does anybody want it? Does anybody, yeah. is, you know, will it will it actually be a product that people want? Not only the machines to put people in business delivering the art, but will they have customers or people who want wall art painted on their right. walls with this machine, as opposed to putting up a wallpaper or a vinyl sticker or a picture on their wall or um, or an artist hand painting something? Um, this was another option. You know, we all know that there's plenty of options in a lot of businesses. There's lots of coffee shops. There's lots of hamburger and pizza places, lots of plumbers out there, um, lots of people doing podcasts. What makes you successful, Ken, and what, me, what makes me successful and what I'm doing is that we cater to an audience. We give them what they want. We give them the information or the service or the product that they want, and we do it honestly and reliably. And so, um, so that hopefully benefits everybody, and now you can create a business. But all of these things have to factor into, should I be doing a startup? Uh, <clears throat> because three years ago, I had the same question, which I've asked myself 15, 20 times prior to that. Um, you know, will this be a viable business? You know, how will I, uh, how will I find out who those customers are? You've got to, I did it through social media because I wasn't the smartest kid on the block when I created this business in December of 2019. And in January of 2020, the world stopped with COVID. And here I was with a machine that nobody had ever seen or heard about <laughs> um, in my markets, which were Canada, the United States, Mexico, South America, the Caribbean. These are all the markets I service today. But nobody has ever seen anything like this before because it was confined for about 14 years to Southeast Asia, a little bit in Europe, a little bit in India and Russia and Australia. But it never came across the pond, so to speak. This technology right. was unknown here. And so here I was sitting there in January of 2020, investing a substantial amount of, of my families and my funds in a business that had a product that I hadn't even begun the exploration yet of, of who wants it. And so what we spent 10 months, you know, using social media, showing videos, showing, um, examples of what this product can do and gave people the opportunity to just say, this looks interesting. Do I want it? You know, what's it all about? And little by little, in August of 2020, eight months later, we sold our first machine. And now three years into it, we sold 120 of them. And, uh, and when I say sold 120, that means we put 120 people in business or right. we've, given, we've given them a product that can supplement their existing business if they happen to be painters or uh, artists or graphics designers. So, anyway, that's a, that's the life of a startup. Yeah, that that's that's super interesting. I, I'm I am curious when you first came across this product, like how how did you view the problem that it solved? Because most people, I mean, I, I never would have would have considered that as you know having a wall printer. But is is that a um, yeah, talk about the problem that that solves and why that's a better solution than than some others might be. Or a, well, you know, yeah. look, there's like I like I just quickly mentioned a moment ago. You got ten different places that sell hamburgers or pizza or coffee shops. What makes one better than the other? You know, it's either the ambiance, it could be the location, it could be the price point. 
Uh, there are all sorts of factors that go into, you know, why do you go to this restaurant or why do you go go and buy this? Why do you buy a shirt from this store and not from that store? You know, why do you buy your sneakers online or go into, um, you know, Dick's Sporting Goods store, whatever the local, you know, sporting goods shop is, you know, that you like to frequent? Um, you know, what, you know, everybody has choices of things. Sometimes you don't have many choices. Um, this was something putting artwork on the wall that I thought had very limited choices. Um, I, I, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, you know, you could buy a picture, frame picture and put it on your wall. You could, you could take a photograph and frame it. You could, uh, you could buy a vinyl sticker and stick it on a wall. Of course, you can't stick vinyl stickers outdoors on brick or something like that. Um, and some places like medical offices and schools, they don't like vinyl because it's toxic. Um, but, uh, that, that aside, um, you could do wallpaper. Um, you could hire an artist to paint a picture on the glass window of your business or on a wall in the, on the inside or outside of your building. So you do have these options, but that, that's a very limited number. And there's a wide range of pricing that those things have today. An artist hand painting something will take weeks to do. Um, I, I know your audience more than likely doesn't have the benefit of video, but in my office here on a, on a wall that's made of cinder block, which my warehouse, is constructed of concrete and cinder block. Um, I've got a wall painting here of a window um, opening up into a pond scene. Um, so I'll try to draw that visual to the audience, but it's five feet by eight feet. It took our wall printer two hours to print this, 40 wow. square foot printed. It would take an artist two days at least to print this. Um, and, and I'm sure it would not have the accuracy of being able to see the eyes in the seagulls that are flying over the pond um, or the screws that are in the hinges on the windows <laughs> that are opening up onto that pond. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice 3D effect um, that, that can be captured because of the quality of the digital image that was created by an artist. An artist who said that I'm putting, taking the food off their table could not be further from the truth because you still need the creativity of the art. So that still has to be created. All our machine does is it provides another option for putting it on a wall reliably and quickly. And so, so it does, it lets the artist continue to create their art. And, and then we go ahead and put it on a wall. So I, I thought I saw that as an opportunity. Um, but then again, I didn't know for sure until I did my research um, and found out that there was an audience for this. People were interested. I do get about 150 inquiries every single day from our social media and website. Wow. Now, now, truth be told, 140 of those 150, they hear it's not a $100 desktop printer like you have, like a, a Hewlett Packard and Epson mm-hmm. or other printer, but it's a $30,000 printing machine, a commercial printing machine that's designed to put people in business delivering this art. And so 140 of those people disappear. Maybe some of them will say, not a business, not an investment I want to make, but um, but maybe I know somebody who has a wall that could want a wall printed. So we capture those those leads, as we call them, and we give them to the local wall printer if and when one exists. But 10 of those 150 are people who aren't scared off by the thought of investing $30,000 in something. And, uh, and so they want to know more. And then we have a Zoom call with them, just like you and I are having right now. And I share more information about the business and the opportunity and what it requires and the maintenance and the support and everything else involved in the business. And then they make a decision. And out of talking to 20 or 30 of those people, one will go ahead and move forward and start up their own business as a wall printing business. And uh, and that's the process of a startup. You know, you go through a lot of, um, you throw a lot of stuff on the wall and you see what sticks. It's a numbers <laughs> game like any other. Um, yeah. And you have to be willing, you have to be willing to go through that process. Um, and you have to do it with, with enough knowledge of what, it, and, and that's, that's a learning curve that I certainly have not achieved 100%. We're always learning, you know, how to articulate what this business is, what these machines will do so that we are getting the right people. You see this as a business, as an opportunity, yeah. um, but does require maintenance and some hands on, you know, effort. Um, and, uh, in, anyway, a, a lot of things that the business requires other than just buying the machine, like any business, you know, you have to deal with, you know, your insurance and your costs and your transportation and feeding yourself and feeding your family. So you still need to have that treasure, you know, aside from the time and talent to do something, to be able yeah. to go through and make the business a success. Wow, that's that's super fascinating. I, I, I've seen your videos or, or maybe maybe some of your 
the people that you've sold the product to, some of their videos I've seen on TikTok. And like my mind was blown the first time I saw it. Just the idea of a printer on the wall. Well, it's, a, it's the same I never with me. I again, that before. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, it, and it was the same with me. And again, just to give you and your audience a perspective on what, what drives somebody to want to start a business. So I usually sit in my office at home and, and I'll be surfing for things. Um, I don't do it too much now because I've got what I want right now today. My hands are pretty full growing this business. But at the same time, when I was between gigs and when that German company approached me initially and, uh, and I said to my wife after I stopped communicating with them because I couldn't make the deal I wanted, which was a good thing, turned out to be, um, because we'd blown them out of the water in terms of competition, um, in terms of what we've done that they haven't been able to. But, uh, that's another story. Um, but regardless, I usually say to my wife, I yell to her from my home office and I say, hey, honey, come come take a look at this. So invariably, when she hears me say, honey, come take a look at this, she goes and cuts up my credit cards and hides the bank account because she says, <laughs> here we go. Paul's going to invest in something crazy. Um, mm. But this time she did take a look and she looked at it and thought it was a really cool machine. And she gave me the go ahead to, yeah, let's let's see you know, how, how you can do with this. And so that's that's what started this up called Wall Rolling uh, four years ago. Yeah, so wow. um, it's, it could be just something as simple as that. And whether that idea comes from an external source, like this company that approached me, and then I did my homework, and I found the company, the manufacturing resource that I wanted to be able to create this business here for, for people's benefits in my markets. Um, or it's something that, you know, you come up with yourself. Just be able, be willing to make that step. Um, but do it intelligently. Do it with your eyes wide open. Do it with with counsel. You know, for me, it was my wife giving me the permission, if you will, to go ahead and invest in this. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, if it's something that requires software development, it's an application um, that you think is a, that you haven't seen before or you've seen, but it doesn't do exactly what you think there's an audience that would benefit from it. Find right. yourself a good developer if you are not a programmer yourself and then find out. What does it take to do this? You know, does it take um, a year and and thousands of hours of programming expertise? Or does it take some, you know, existing technology that just has to be repurposed in a new way to create a new solution to a problem? These are all the things that just require sometimes your own talent or you identifying somebody else's talent that you trust that can be a part of your new venture and journey. Yeah. Going back to the idea of the, of creating a startup, is there, is there a good way to identify the type of people who, who might be well suited for creating a new business versus those who should be better off working for somebody? Cause as a, as a business owner myself, very small business, I, I can identify people that haven't what I call an employee mentality. Like they just want to, to show up do a little bit of work and then get their paycheck and go home and lay on the couch for the weekend and watch movies. What, what's a good way to tell the difference between those two types of people? Well, first of all, let me say right off the bat, God bless those people. Um, I, um, you know, the, the world, um, the world would not be what it is. If we didn't have right. the people who were willing to get up and drive the truck or, or, you know, mow the lawn or, or go to work and be a programmer. Uh, and again, knowing your limitations, um, uh, you know, to, you know, what makes you happy? You know, you know, my father, he worked nine to five, you know, five days a week because he wanted to come home and be with his family and go swimming with me at the end of a day or something like that. You know, that, that's what was important to him. Work was just a means to an end for him. Yeah. Um, for me, it's part that, but it's more really my life. I mean, I, I work 24 seven pretty much. Um, and because I work with a company that's based in China also, um, you know, round the clock, you know, it's with a 12 hour time difference and things like that. You know, I'm, I'm up, up and working in all hours and things. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, you, you need to, you need to assess your own. Once again, I've said it before in this conversation, your own risk tolerance. Um, and what, what are your goals? But if you, if you have, if you have the desire to have more control, Here's, let me answer it this way. Somebody said to me a long time ago when um, I wasn't being paid what I thought I should have been paid. Um, I worked for, I worked as a, as a manager for a manufacturing company. Um, I worked two weeks, a week, two weeks out of the month in sales, two weeks out of the month in man- managing 
uh, the factory and overseeing orders that I created in those first two weeks. Um, I, I really liked the sales part, didn't really like the management part and the factory work, uh, but it was part of the job and it's what I did. And I did very well for myself and the company and they paid me very well. I found out at the end of, of the year that I was given a bonus. It was a very nice bonus. I was young. I was in my 30s. It was after I sold my, um, before the restaurant business and after I sold my sporting goods stores. Um, uh, and I wanted to learn more and this guy made me the offer. I couldn't refuse. And so I, I went to work for them. And uh, I did very well. I was in my 20s. I had a condo on the beach um, on Long Island. I was living large, um, had a really nice, nice uh, lifestyle. Um, but I saw that I got a nice Christmas bonus. Um, but I also knew that the owners of the company uh, rewarded themselves tenfold what I did as a result of my sales efforts. And so mm-hmm. I went in the next day after receiving this bonus, thanked them very much. I said, I really love the job. I appreciate the opportunity. I said, but I, I think I, I deserve a raise um, come come the new year and everything. And he said to me something that I still take to heart today um, and, and pass along, hopefully, to anybody that has worked for me over the years. And what he said was, Paul says, when you work for somebody, you will never, ever make what you think you're worth. But when you work for me, I'll make sure I pay you better than anybody else. Will. And And that was very true. And I quit. Um, and so I said, thank you very much. And I tendered my resignation. And I went to work for a competitor that allowed me to do the sales two weeks out of the month and not work the rest of the stuff because he didn't want me. The, the other competitor of his didn't want me to do any of the factory work. He had that covered. He just wanted me to sell. It. And so mm-hmm. I worked half the time and made twice the money. Um, and so that was my decision making process is that my time was valuable to me. There were other interests I had. That's when I actually had the luxury to get involved with my partner and, and then became got into the restaurant business. Um, but uh, the decision making again, to answer all this is my long winded way. Apologies to your audience. Oh, no, of, you're great. <laughs> of, of, of trying to trying to answer your question of, you know, do I work for somebody or do I work for myself? Um, you will never, ever make what you think you're worth when you work for somebody. You may be happy with what you're doing. You may make good money. Um, and that might be enough. For me, it wasn't. For me, I wanted more control. I wanted more flexibility. Um, and I thought that I could find a different path. Um, and I was willing to take the risk and walk away from a very good paying job to have that flexibility, which then led me into another whole path with the restaurant business and business ownership and real estate. I invested in the building when I bought the restaurant, that kind of stuff. So um, it, it carried me through to a totally new path in my life. So again, you just have to you know, decide what, what works for you. Um, you know, it was, some of the stuff is product based that we've been talking about in this conversation. You know, do you have a product that solves a problem? Um, do you have a, you know, the resources to be able to develop or sell or market that product and identify the customers? But it really starts with you. And if you're the person who should be in business in a startup, doing a startup, these are the kind of decisions you have to make. You know, um, not the least of which is the financial. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Wow, that that's very well stated, very succinct. I think anybody that that listens to that can can definitely tell, you know, go through that decision making matrix. I mean, creating a, a system out of that and saying, should I do my own thing, or or right now is now the time for me to work for somebody? I I like how succinct let, you were there. And let let me just say, Ken, to you and your audience, um, don't think you have to make these decisions yourself. Um, don't be afraid to leverage a trusted network that hopefully you have, even if it's yeah. a sibling or a parent or a best friend or a coworker, somebody you trust, somebody who knows you. Uh, because let me tell you, life is all about relationships. Um, you know, there's, there's the expression, you know, be nice to the people on the way up because they're the same ones you're going to see on the way down. Um, mm-hmm. everybody's, everybody's journey is not going to be a straight line. Um, you know, it's going to have its peaks. It's going to have its valleys and relationships and the people who you trust and the people who trust in you will also drive this path. Whether you should continue in a job, working, learning more, whatever the reason for being in that job might be, whether it be financial or educational, um, or determining what it is you want to do when you grow up, um, or at the point at which you want to start a business of your own, you may have to rely on other people's talent, money, something else. And even in those in-between jobs or at the time it takes to go from your idea to actually making money 
um, in a business that you're starting up. You may need to rely on those resources of people who have faith in you. I've, I can't count the number of times that I, I was, you know, scrounging around for pennies in my couches or trying to put gas money in my car, um, you know, so I can get to the next thing that I needed to do. Um, and I took jobs for minimum wage or no wage just to be able to get through and learn something or, or to get to the next, next step, um, in my, my career path. Um, and, and a lot of that was supplemented by the good graces of people who trusted me and trusted in me to find my way and to, or to succeed in a business I had. So nurturing those relationships, um, and that doesn't mean taking advantage of people. Um, right. There's nobody in my life that I have not repaid financially for their investment in me. Um, if, if, it, if the relationship was based on, on proper and, and, and good intentions, um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, and I'm proud that the people that I grew up with from the time I was born, literally, um, to, the, to today, um, these relationships have lasted over the years, and many of them have worked for me. Some of them have invested in me. Um, some of them may just got, just got me through from one day to the next. Um, and uh, and here I am. So, you know, that's, it that's definitely part takes, of the journey, too. Yeah, we definitely don't get to the places we want to get to on our own. There's, it's definitely other people play a lot into that. I did want to ask you one more thing before we end, though. I think you said you're, what, 71 years old? I did say that. Yes. <laughs> what What is it that keeps you, even at an age where most people are retiring or have been retired, you know, for for a while? What is it that keeps you pushing forward and interested in new startup opportunities now? Well, um, the short answer is I'm still trying to figure out what Paul wants to do when he grows up. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I just I, I do get very passionate about something that I believe, in. and 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 what that translates into is usually creating a business opportunity for myself, for my family, for my employees, uh, for growing a team, um, and, and and then for my customers, of course, um, who hopefully are satisfied and uh, and help that growth uh, more than mm. anybody else. Uh, but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, there are a lot of – I do like playing tennis. I do like swimming. Um, those are my two passions. I have dogs, uh, which take um, – Probably not as much time, but more time than what I care to think about. Certainly more money than I care to think about. Um, but um, what we spend on our dogs, I think, is more than <laughs> our kids sometimes. Um, but uh, we weren't fortunate. We weren't blessed or fortunate enough to have a two-legged children. So our children are four-legged. And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, with that said, these are things that I, I like and spend more time doing. Um, but but I, li- I love this. I, I, like, I like creating... Uh, business opportunities for other people. And this, this particular one now, I think this might be my last hurrah. Um, I think that I'm going to grow this to the point that, um, I can then leave it to my employees. Um, hopefully they will grow with the business to the extent that they would want to keep it going when I don't anymore. Um, and, uh, uh, even though there are several exit paths that I have in mind, but, uh, the employees is my first preference. Um, and, uh, and, and again, it just, uh, you know, what keeps me going is just just doing good. Um, I also do a lot of give back at the local university. I help startups. I help people, um, again, leveraging the hats I wear best, which is sales, marketing, customer relationships. Um, I'm a mentor at the local university of North Carolina here in Wilmington, and I sit on the advisory board of the local entrepreneurship um, school of business um, that's at the university. They have an excellent entrepreneurship program um, at the Cameron uh, School of Business here at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. And uh, and I, I like, uh, I really get a lot of energy from the younger people. Um, I hire from the university. Um, I, my first hires were, were out of the university. I, I provide internship opportunities for people um, here. Uh, and this is just a stepping stone to whatever their careers might, might become. Um, and that I enjoy doing that too. And so that's another thing that gets me up in the morning is knowing that I'm creating an opportunity for other people like that. And, uh, so anyway. Yeah. That's, that's great. What I'm, what I'm hearing is find things that, that drive you, that keep you motivated, happy, and that, you know, that, that you're passionate about. I love that. that that's what keeps you going. Where can people find out more about you, your product that you're selling? Where should they go to to discover that and and see if it's something that maybe they want to get started in or find their local wall printer? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, again, this, this isn't a pitch for the wall printer, but if somebody wants to know something about that um, and, and is interested in the startup business, that might be right for them and their budget um, and their passion. Um, you can go to thewallprinter.com. That's our website. Um, it'll take about 15 seconds on the website to see what the machine does and what it's all about. And there's a quick contact form. You can give me your information and we'll get your information and arrange for a call just like this, like we're having, and a conversation mm-hmm. to answer questions. But if you just want to connect with me, uh, again, not an advertisement for LinkedIn, but I like LinkedIn as a professional network, um, as opposed to the social media aspects of TikTok and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah which are are great communication tools on a social, but, you know, nobody, nobody other than my immediate family and friends cares what I ate last night or when when I walked (laughs) the dogs last. Um, So, uh, so that's, that's, that's the stuff of Facebook and Instagram. Uh, But if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, you know, do a search for Paul Barron. Uh, There might be many of Paul Barron's out there, but I'm sure you'll figure out which one is me. Um, And then feel free to connect. And I'm happy to have conversations with anybody. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely get those links in the show notes. I really appreciate you joining me today. It's been a fascinating conversation for sure. Thank you, Ken. I really enjoyed talking to you. I hope your audience enjoys it as well. 